Hence, Pro says, non-lawyers should remember when attending mediation. Part of the series, Mediation Tips by Fran. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Lawyers and Mediators International Show and Podcast from SMediations.com, where we discuss law and conflict resolution topics to educate both professionals and everyday people. Please remember, nothing contained in these episodes constitutes legal advice, so please make sure that you speak with an attorney. Hi, I'm Mac Pierre-Louis, attorney, mediator, and arbitrator, working throughout Florida and Texas as a mediator. And I'm Natalia Owska-Czajka, advocat, mediator, and arbitrator based in Warsaw, Poland. And I'm Fran Brockstein. I'm an attorney and a mediator in Texas. Please remember that all the materials contained therein and in this discussion and any past and future shows, you can find on our website, instantmediations.com, on the Lawyers and Mediators International YouTube channel and on its podcasts, all conveniently also available from the Instant Mediations app, where we also have many useful resources for anybody being unrepresented in mediation by any sort of lawyer. So please check it up and be sure to stay connected. All right. So in today's episode, we're going through a list of hints that you, the uh, party or mediation participant who doesn't have a lawyer, that you need to know in order to make sure you have a successful mediation that's going to work to your benefit. Not all mediations might work out, of course, but you have a much better chance of doing it and a much better chance of making your mediator happy if you stick to these following hints and tips. But first, let's check in with Fran and including share her new and improved <laughs> website that's just been launched recently. Fran? Yeah, there you are. Thank you. So yeah, Fran, let us know what's going on with your new website. Uh, I, After 10 years, I finally revised it. I was told I was out of date. So I now have a streamlined website that is strictly based for mediation, and I took off all my legal stuff. Okay, so you're focusing mainly on mediation, right? And I know that you had your website forever, and you had a ton of documents on there before. I have a lot of uh, mediation documents. I took off a lot of the litigation stuff I had. Yes, I was one of the first attorneys in Houston to have a website. I've had one over 25 years. So my first website was actually designed by a high school student. It was one page. Wow. So here, everything is streamlined, has the prices and the fees and articles and how to contact you, the links. So everything is here, nice and nice to home. Right. Awesome. All right, Fran, remind people who are listening how long you've been doing this because this is why we have you on. I've been an attorney in Texas over 30 years and I've been mediating exclusively for over 17 years and I love it. I find it much more rewarding and personally fulfilling than I ever felt as an attorney. I really feel like I do help people with resolve issues. All right. Thank you for that. So the first hint that we're going to go through, and uh, we all think that most people who come to mediation already know, but we take it for granted. The first big hint is that the mediated settlement agreement, the document you actually end up receiving and signing off on to finish the mediation, that the mediation set of the mediated settlement agreement is actually a binding and non-revocable document. Guys, let's just go around and talk a little bit about this. Fran, you want to lead us? Uh, yes, I think people need to understand how powerful a mediated settlement agreement is. And if you do sign it, you can't go to the judge and complain later that you want to revoke it. Um, so it's very important that people carefully read it, understand it, make sure it includes everything they want and that they realize that it is basically a contract to go forward on what they're going to do in the future. Yes, I want to add up to that because this is also um, why it is so important to understand. Since you are going to have a binding contract, whether it is civil law, whether it is a family law, you need to understand that it can actually replace the entire court case 
or it can, it can supplement the court case. So you can mediate when you are already in the court. However, please remember that the court is a place where you can expect a rigid decision from an unknown person. When you go to mediation, you are going to have the same binding effect. However, it will be tailor made by you. You go there, you prepare, you put the, the issues you want to be resolved in mediation on the table. And if the other party agrees to mediating all the things that you want to be mediated, you want to be included, then the mediated uh, MSA, as we call it, Mediated Settlement Agreement, will include all those issues, even more than you would cover if it was done in the court by a judgment or by an order. Yeah, and the last thing I'll add to this before we move on to the next one, next hint, is in Texas, in this jurisdiction, you specifically have to have in conspicuous language that phrase that says that this agreement, before you sign it, is binding and not revocable. The other, the other side can get a judgment on this thing. There's no take back. You can change your mind the next morning. You know, I've had the example where as an attorney, I represent a client, we go to mediation, and then the next day, my client, after they go home and speak to their family members, comes back to me and they say, hey, I want to do over. I, I don't think I got a fair deal. Well, that's the problem. Unless the other side agrees with you that you didn't get a fair deal and they want to go ahead and change things up, you're stuck. So please make sure that you don't sign off on an agreement that's going to be binding and unrevocable. Okay, so that's uh, the two cents on that. All right. Hint number two, paper the case yourself or with the help of an attorney. What do you mean, what do you mean by this? So typically when you go to a mediator, the mediator's job is to be the mediator, not the attorney to draft and prepare all the documentation, okay? Because they can't wear multiple hats. And so when you finally finish up the, me the mediation and you get your agreement, everything is good to go and you leave with that mediation settlement agreement, well, you still need to convert it into a final order for the judge to sign off and so you can have your judgment. But you can't expect a mediator to do it. So you got to be ready to do that yourself. You got to be ready to have an attorney on the side or you got to be ready to educate yourself on how to do this yourself. So ladies, what are your thoughts? And many people are not aware that many mediators are not attorneys. And so it will depend on the jurisdiction that you're in is um, I know many very successful mediators that are non-attorneys and um, the skill set to be a mediator is completely different than being an attorney. And so it was a learning process for me to learn to be a good mediator and not put on my attorney hat. So um, I have had people get mad at me because I will not do the final paperwork. And any mediator that will does want to do your final paperwork, you should run from. Because that is very clear that mediators are supposed to stay in their lane and not shift to being an attorney. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And uh, here um, in Poland where I practice, the mediated settlement agreement is also subject to approval, but the first approval leads to enforcement and the second approval, the second type of approval by the court leads to the mediation being binding. So enforceable in the court in, the, in all its terms, like for example, parental authority or where the child lives or the contacts. However, when I mean reinforceable in the very first sense, if you, for example, agree on the child support or on any figure in terms of a claim for payment, it is going to be enforceable by the, the same way as any court order or judgment would, would be. And therefore, the wording that is there is extremely important so that it has, it bears no doubt who owes whom, upon which terms, and how it is going to be enforced. Yeah, and the last thing I'll add to that before moving, moving on to hint number three is the reason that is so important for the mediator, or I should say a reason that it's so important for the mediator not to draft the final paperwork is because the mediated settlement agreement is usually a very thin, you know, maybe one or two page, just brief summary of the terms you've agreed on. But the actual judgment 
the the binding and forcible judgment that the judge is going to sign is usually quite thick, quite lengthy, has all the legalese that makes it enforceable. And you don't want the problem to exist where there's misinterpretation, where the mediator, who's supposed to be neutral, is in the business of drafting an enforceable document to where later on, if people start not following the agreement, there's finger pointing and they say, well, the mediator drafted it. Well, that's not what I meant. So it's very clear. Mediator will draft the mediated settlement agreement and then it will be produced into a binding agreement with the legalese that makes it enforceable, it gives it teeth. And usually that's to be, supposed to be done by an attorney. So in my situation, I just give parties who are in my mediations, you know, maybe the contact information of other lawyers who can go and represent them and help them themselves, or they're free to Google and go find somebody themselves. And there's plenty of lawyers out there who are willing to maybe for a lower cost, write up the judgment for you. All right. Oh, go ahead. Somebody wanted to ask something. I was going to add that when I write up a mediated settlement agreement, I purposely write it in very simple language that people can understand. I purposely do not use lawyer language. Yeah. And I've had some lawyers get mad at me, but it's important that the people understand what they're agreeing to. Exactly. Good point. All right. Hit number three. Research the law yourself or if you can get a lawyer or consult one at least, talk to them so you can get educated on the law. Don't expect the mediator to be your lawyer, especially if they don't even have a law license. All right. So research the law yourself. Come get educated and know the you know local rules, rules of procedure, and all the things you need to know before you come to the mediation that will make your mediator happy and will help you have a agreement that actually will make sense in the context of the law and the jurisdiction in which you operate. Mac, I just want to echo that. It's very important that people understand what the current laws are for your jurisdiction. Because, I'm, for example, in Texas, the Texas legislature meets every two years and they change or modify or create new laws. And many times people come to me and they're talking about their parents' divorce or their parents, some lawsuit that occurred many years ago and the laws have changed. So I just really encourage people to at least meet with a lawyer for an hour and discuss their case in detail one-on-one -on -one, so that they're at least aware of what the current laws of that state that or country they live in so that they come in and they're current. We are talking here to people who potentially face the situation of mediation and we already know that they are not going to have lawyers. However, as we've been discussing, it is good to consult one and it is not a bad thing to ask for a pause in mediation for a break. So that if you have any issues, if you have any questions, you can talk to your lawyer. This pause might even mean that the mediation will be rescheduled to an, another date if the parties and the mediators agree on that. But it's important you understand your rights and obligations, you know where you are, you know where you are heading, and please remember that your situation needs to be reflected um, in all aspects that sometimes are not even known to the mediator or to the other party that you are mediating with. You talk to your lawyer about it, and then you know it better, and then you address certain issues in the mediation. I also practice the fact that when uh, there is already a draft mediated settlement agreement, I also ask the parties to go to their lawyers and check whether they like the wording in there or whether everything is covered, so that before we signed, it's double-checked. Thank you. Hit number four, mediators are not lawyers. Okay, what is and what is not a mediation? This is so important because all us mediators have had the challenge where folks come to us for mediation and they act like we are their attorneys and they want us to give them legal advice. This echoes uh, hit number three, you know, redo your own research or talk to a lawyer. But let's say you haven't done all the research you have done. Or let's say you didn't bother going to talk to an attorney. Well, don't come to the mediator and treat them like they're the attorney. And don't expect 
the mediator to act like an attorney, like an advocate in the mediation where they are fighting one side against the other. Look, mediation is not litigation, okay? The mediation is where parties meet with a neutral, impartial mediator set up as a mechanism to help resolve a dispute, okay? And the mediator's job is to facilitate a discussion to that will lead eventually to a settlement agreement. That's the goal. While well, litigation and what lawyers do is to go fight in court and to represent and zealously advocate for the uh, for one side against the other. And so don't force a mediator, don't expect a mediator to play both sides. So this is a really, really, really very important one, especially for us mediators who are also attorneys. We can only be one or the other, not both. Well, Mac, once again, I'm going to agree with you 100%. I have a lot of people that say, well, what would the judge do? I go, I don't care what the judge would do. This is the agreement between the two of you. What do you want to accomplish today? I am there to facilitate them coming to agreements. I do not make agreements. Many times the people want to do something that personally I may not even like, but they want to do it. And what I try to do because I'm older and I have some gray hair and I've lived a long life is I reality check with people. I ask them lots of questions and dig to find out what, you know, what the true motivation is that they want to do. And I help them figure out ways to accomplish what they want, but it's not my mediation. It's their mediation and they need to be involved in it and come and plan to work really hard to resolve their case. And I will say several times with people without attorneys, I will do several sessions with them so that we can go slowly and they can think about the different things that I bring up. And the what else the mediator is not. Mediator is not a psychologist. Yeah. Mediator is not a social worker. Mediator is not someone that you need to make confessions to. And mediator is not someone who is going to judge you. <laughs> These are all very important factors that you need to take into account. You go to mediation to feel safe, but not to get psychological help if you need one. And likewise, mediator is not a doctor, including not a psychiatrist, if um, there is a need for special treatment. Um, please do not expect the mediator to um, understand all the complexity, whether in legal, psychological terms of everything. But the most important part of it, giving you safety and confidence that you are in the right place, is that mediator is not going to judge you, notwithstanding the fact what you are sharing with them. And the guarantee to that is the confidentiality of the mediation. So when you are um, one by one, um, just face to face in the mediator, which is possible in mediation, even online in the breakout rooms for, on Zoom, for example, you can fully trust your mediator that whatever you share is not going to be passed on to the other party if you make this reservation. And nothing that you share in mediation can leave the mediation room, whether the physical room or the um, virtual room, you are just safe there, even if the mediator is not a psychologist, not a social worker, not a doctor. And I'll underscore two things that Tyler just said. Mediation is confidential, meaning what goes in mediation stays in mediation. And mediation, while it might not be a place where you can go and get psychological help or whatever else, mediation, mediation does allow you to vent a little bit, okay? So yes, mediators will tolerate it because we want to hear you. We want to hear from you. Speak your heart in a way that is never going to happen in court because that judge only expects to hear the facts and it makes a decision. But in mediation, it's a little more flexible. You have a chance to kind of speak your mind and your heart with the goal being that it should help push the agreement further. Okay, guys, we got time for one more and we're 19 minutes in. Yeah. So mediation should provide both parties this is a, a big hint to everyone who's coming to mediation without lawyers mediation should provide both parties all parties with safety a safe place to come and a place to feel respected and have no intimidation 
because if those things are happening, then it's not going to be a fair mediation experience where people are agreeing from their heart, from their own volition. Okay. So mediation needs to be safe, respectable, and no intimidation. Absolutely. Um, and I always like to say at the end of the mediation, if you both hate me and we come to a resolution, then I've done a good job because I am not an advocate for either party. I'm there to try to help them resolve their dispute. And in some cases, we come to the res agreement that this case needs to be litigated. It does not need to be resolved, that there are some major problems or trust issues that need either further investigation or to go see a judge. And please know that the safety and non-intimidation is extremely important in the cases where family violence is involved in any of its form, whether it is a financial pressure, whether it was physical abuse or verbal abuse. Mediator is there to provide safety environment to address all your concerns. And even more, when it all happens online, you can be isolated from any person that is um, engaged in a dispute with you and that you feel threatened from. So you are safe there. You can demand that you can be put into a separate room, either to talk physically or online um, into a breakout room, and you stay safe and non -int not intimidated the entire time. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us again. I hope that hence pro se's, non-lawyers, should remember when attending mediation was helpful and informative. And that's the intention of all these episodes. So if you're going to come to see any of us mediators or any mediators out there in the, in the public space, please make sure that you get educated. That, uh, I guess to recap, the mediation agreement is binding and non-revocable. Paper the case yourself. Make sure that you get a lawyer to do it or get ready to do it yourself because your lawyer ain't doing it. I mean, your mediator ain't doing it. Research the law yourself. Talk to a lawyer. Mediators are not lawyers. Know what mediation is and is not. And remember, safety, respectability, and no intimidation. All right. Until next time. Thanks, ladies. Thanks for listening and tuning in. Bye-bye. Have a great day.